welcome to Direction Correct, a feelings podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, Nathan Carter, professor of organizational behavior at Michigan State University. Thanks to our sponsors, Lightcast. The world is full of talent data, but more data can lead to more questions, uncertainty, and stagnation as organizations sift through it to figure out what's fact from what's fiction. Lightcast's talent intelligence platform answers your most difficult workforce questions to drive meaningful business results. With more than 20 years of experience as MC and Burning Glass, Lightcast accelerates your work, bringing together hundreds of billions of vetted, constantly updated data points and incredible insights to drive strategic talent decisions. Your organization can tap into the deepest open repository of skills, supply and demand data in the world to transform your hunches into a skills-based future for your organization. Lightcast's flexible solution, used by 67 of the Fortune 100, can integrate your own data, be guided by in-house talent experts, and give you the tools and confidence to explore it for yourself. To learn more, book a demo at lightcast.io. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. Have you ever heard of the Annoyatron? No, what is that? It, it's like a, I, I have never bought one, but it's like a $3 investment. You can get them on Amazon. And it is a little watch battery powered electronic board that makes a beep sound at random intervals. Like you can set it for, you know, once an hour or whatever. It. But it, it's so annoying and so random. The, and it's tiny, so you can just put it anywhere, and people can't find it because there's not enough like feedback to actually echo locate where yeah. this thing is. So if like you really hate a coworker, just stick that right in there, like their office cube wall or something like that, or right behind their desk or something, and just drive them absolutely nuts. I love the idea. I'm not advocating, for it, but uh, I like the idea too. I I just love it because it it utilizes the same behavioral techniques that gambling does of intermittent reinforcement um, uh-huh. to, to maximally annoy you, you know, like that's perfect. You couldn't have built it any better. <laughs> I mean, those psycho- uh, psychological principles, they, they can work both ways, right? Exactly. <laughs> I think that's what they do to people in torture and stuff. I don't know. Oh, Jesus Christ, man. Uh, I was in DC uh, attending, I think it was a work function, but my room, and this is like only a year and a half ago, it had a uh, cordless phone. And I mean, it was a nice hotel. It wasn't like from like 1997 or anything like that. It had, it had a cordless phone in there and the battery was dying on this thing and I stuck it on the charger and it's still not working. It's like just once every like five minutes, like beep, beep. Uh, luckily, luckily the room had a mini fridge you know, you like mm-hmm. pop open the dresser. And eventually in the middle of the night, I took this phone and stuck it in the mini fridge and just closed it. And look, it, I couldn't hear it anymore. Thank God. But that was the <laughs> only solution I could find. Cause like couldn't take the batteries <laughs> out. Couldn't do anything. It wasn't charging. Your only solution was the mini fridge to either put it inside or use the mini fridge to smash it to pieces. <laughs> I never make use of the mini fridge. I'm always, I'm always afraid. I feel like that's going the way of the dodo bird. It used to be like a thing where, you know, hotel rooms would have mini fridges with mini bars in it and then they'd upcharge you for the mini bar stuff. That doesn't seem to exist very much anymore. I don't know. You, you just don't see it like you used to. Where in Vegas, they had like a full array of liquor that you could obviously mm-hmm. enjoy. I was some, where, where the hell was I? I think it was in know. Austin, like just more liquor than i've ever seen in my life in the room and of course i'm sure it's just crazy prices i mean it is austin uh, that makes sense like you would be like new orleans austin vegas maybe nashville that still are kind of going with those trends do you have any trips coming up i got a couple um I'm kind of excited about uh, I'm co-chairing People Analytics World in London. Holy uh, shit! With, really? With, yeah, with uh, with David Green, and so that that's coming up. That'll be exciting. That is super awesome, man. I didn't know that. Congratulations! And it'll be the first time I've left the country since before the pandemic, too. So that'll be cool. That is cool. Have you ever been to London? I went in high school. Mm. Yeah. So it'll. I imagine it's changed a lot. Uh, 
my wife and I were actually talking about like what, like what, what's cool that's new and what's cool that's like super old in London that you would want to see, you know? You got to visit like, well, I mean, like certain things are like kind of timeless. Tower of London. That's what I mean. Like the things that are like, you know, ancient, but awesome to see. And then like what, what's new school that would be cool to hit up as well. Um, Because my understanding is the British aren't known for their food. Apologize Brits who listen to the pod, but that's my, my, most of the vacations I go on is to eat. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so. uh, that, that's funny you say that because like i have no desire to i mean i understand people like want to go on this like culinary adventure and that's not mm-hmm. my orientation whatsoever and the british are known for their food just not in the way you want right yeah yeah i feel you on that i guess i guess their uh uh signature dish is indian food really that's what i'm hearing nowadays actually yeah I mean, the, the legacy of the British Empire, you know, I think the prime minister is is, from, is of Indian descent as well, I believe. Is he? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it is truly an international city. It's a hub. I don't really yeah. know the lineage to know how that happened. Yeah. Well. So what, what are you going to do with this uh, analytics world conference? Just kind of uh, MC it? Yeah, it's more of an MC role. It's like a figurehead role. <laughs> Nothing of importance. I think that's pretty fucking important. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, that's one of those things that, uh, you know, before the new gig kind of got lined up, which was cool. How'd you get wrapped up in that? Uh, I've been, well, for a while there, I was doing a lot of stuff with uh, uh, the, the company that puts on People in the World is called Tucana. Yeah, And they, so I co-chaired their strategic workforce planning conference last year in San Diego. Um, and I was doing kind of some guest spots on their podcast at one point or another too. Um, <clears throat> but that, that just kind of fell through. Uh, but we've been talking about it for a while. It just never would work out with calendars. And so this year it finally worked out, which was nice. Awesome, man. Yeah. What about you? What travel do you have coming up? Uh, I'm coming to Texas. I hope hope to see you soon. High five. High five, indeed. Maybe uh, maybe we'll do a live one. Maybe we won't. Who knows? Give the people what they want. What do the people want? That's a good question. Us to stop talking? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, you made it. How's it going, guys? What's good. up, How are you? man? I'm feeling very modern. This is the first time I've ever um, used Air- AirPods. <laughs> I, I I feel that I recently just they're my wife's. To... <laughs> they're your wife's. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sharing yeah, technology. Yeah, yeah I, I just I like the wires. I, I'll lose it. I'll lose these like immediately. Like my wife is scared I will lose them during this. Cole, Cole's got the same issue where someone's uh, his. I, I think it's his wife is rearranging his USB plugs on his uh, computer. <laughs> I'm also, by the way, oh, hold on one second. Sorry. I'm a a forced iPhone user. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't want to, I would still have an Android if it weren't for, for my wife basically forcing me into, into the Apple world. But yeah. So yeah. I'm with with you too. Like I I recently upgraded to a new set of uh, AirPods, but I I, I'm too shy to use them on an actual meeting. So like I I approve your uh, braveness, definitely. (laughs) Are we recording right now? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. Okay. (laughs) Now it gets serious. (laughs) I don't want to use. I don't want to use off-color language. So. Well, oh, it's we, fine. we use it's off-color fine. language. Yeah. All right, all right, cool. But you, you're you're a difficult man to reach. Uh, I am. If, <laughs> if, if you Google Nathan Carter at Michigan State University, or or, or you're very versatile. I'll put it that yeah, way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, were, yeah, were you a Heisman Google... candidate at one point, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. No clue. The, the, this is the first time that I've been aware of college football talent before other people in my <laughs> life. So, um, yeah, cause it was that Nate, Nathan, <laughs> the running back 
uh, started here. And then one day I went to log into my into my uh, travel expenses uh, portal, and it said that I had been to uh, South Bend, Indiana, and uh, a lot of Big Ten <laughs> places that I had not been. Happy and Valley. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so anyway, but they they wouldn't let me keep his travel budget. So. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's a sly way to do it, right? Just like, yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't this Nathan Carter. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the running back, you know, and they would just sign away on it. So, yeah. I think that there's like a really famous economist named like Michael J. Jordan, which seems equally I think that's difficult. Right. That's right. Well, luckily, his middle name wasn't B, you know. Michael B. Isn't Jordan. Isn't there an actor also... named Michael B. Jordan? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, well, I mean, two really like very common first name, very common last name. It's got to happen all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I would say yeah. There's a but there's like a got to be a year after which no one names their kid like no one with the last name Jordan names their kid Michael, or at least very few do. I've seen a lot of like Kobe's pop up now, like babies named Kobe. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, but the question is, though, are those babies people with the last name Bryant? <laughs> right? Like, like you couldn't do, do that. Do you want to do that like to your you kid? You can have a Kobe Carter. You, know? you can't have a Kobe Bryant, right? <laughs> I'm saying Kobe beef. like it's beef. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I just realized, like, I'm pronouncing it like the beef. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think I might be the only Cole Napper out there, so these are not problems I'm accustomed to. Napper, I feel like, is a, is that an occupational thing? Maybe. Um, <laughs> I do like sleeping, so there's that. Because, <laughs> like, Car- Carter is an occupation. And, and, in fact, this is a study I've, like, wanted to conduct for a long time, but um, basically I don't want to waste a grad student's time with it, but it's to look at – occupational surnames and whether or not the like reassec profile would match people with that occup like if we have those people you know they don't know what we're doing they fill out the reassec would their profile match their uh their occupational surname so you know smith you know so like what what a blacksmith does or whatever right and so so that's a that's a little pet pet project I want to do, but have not. Do you think there's like some epigenetics involved there where people, you know, want to keep doing things of their, I mean, well, and also, I mean, I I think it's more that like we survived by doing that for a long time. Right. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, think people take on the family business. You, for a long time, the only person you learned to trade from was your parents. So You know, so anyway, but yeah, you'd obviously have to control for some, you know, cultural, (laughs) cultural differences and things like that. But, you know, occupational surnames are pretty common just about everywhere. But, yeah, I I love the idea of like going to O-Night, identifying the different sort of PSAs available and then trying to get into their current job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And more more so not even their current job because they may hate their current job. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and the question is, like, you know, does a would a Carter be happier making wagons, right? Because that, oh, that's yeah. what the the people who were named Carter that the reason they got named that was because they, and, and well, and then you could also like, you know, do because then there were like where you live type names, right? Like, uh, so like my grandmother's maiden name was Barnhill. And that just means like you live on, they had a barn on a hill. <laughs> it's at some right. point, somebody had a barn on a hill. And so, so yeah, but, uh, so, so, but the occupational surnames for whatever reason, fascinating. But. I, 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 in like 80, hundred years. Oh, okay. Like right, right now you could say like, oh, my, my great grandpappy, he was a, he was a sharecropper. Right. Right. Like, oh, right, wow, right. That's really right. awesome. In <laughs> yeah. like eight, 80 years, it's going to be like my great grandpappy. He was a social media influencer. It yes. just like really doesn't hit the same, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can't. I think it. Can't remember if it's Nate Bergazzi, but there's some stand-up comedian that has a bit that's like, 
Like it used to be that like, you'd be like, here's this, the one picture of like my grandparents. <laughs> and now you'd be like, and then in like a hundred years, it's going to be like, do you want to see 4,000 pictures of my, <laughs> of my grandmother? Oh, absolutely. You know? Like there's just, it's yeah, it's a pretty ridiculous amount of photographs we have of ourselves. See, Scott, this is the type of heavy hitting research you get to do as a tenured professor. Yeah. That's right. Well, it's the type you want to do, but can't find time to do between all your administrative meetings. Yeah, I was like, what do tenured professors do? Well, we, I mean, you, on some level, you become like support staff, right? So you're, you're, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm on the advisory committee for the department chair. I'm on committees for the university, communities, committees for the college. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the nice thing is you're not just like, so I would say, so I became a full professor. And so I got tenure in what, 2000. 16 or 17 and then i got full when i moved here in 2020 and i would say you honestly just get less get to do less of what you want to do and and, and people <laughs> and people tell you that as you're going through right like like oh enjoy it and, and i mean they do this in grad school enjoy it now and you're like like how much harder can it be right and, and like, I can still remember, and I like hate this version of myself. And it's a, I never would have said it. Now I feel like some students would like say it out loud, but I would never have said this out loud. But I can remember my, like, like I would email my advisor something and four or five days would pass. And I would go like, I mean, what could he be doing? Of course. You know, of course. and now <laughs> I know exactly <laughs> what he was doing and it sucks. And he would have rather been reading my paper <laughs> like and you know and that's kind of the place that i'm at now where it's like you kind of get um yeah you're the you're this basically everybody know you know and also i mean part of it too is trying to take any type of administrative burden off of tenure track faculty right so people who aren't tenured now right so you know the worst type of a full professor is the one who like isn't doing the committee work and stuff like that, <laughs> because that means somewhere an assistant or associate is being asked to do it. Right. And so, so every, every full professor that won't do that kind of stuff, it's displaced down and, you know, ends up trickling down to, to the pe people who still are under time pressure, but it's like be, be be careful what you wish for, right? Like oh, yeah, yeah, everyone yeah, tells yeah. you to climb the ladder, get ahead, do more. I, I will say academics will tell you, like take your time, you know, don't worry about going to full, you know, because because with full you're not on a clock, right? Yeah, you can go up whenever you want. You can stay associate as long as you want, and with associate you do take on more kind of administrative, you know just being in endless meetings type stuff, but full, that's when they really lay the hammer. That's down. Really, like we, got, <laughs> yeah. we got this guy. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you don't have great excuses to say no. You know? so, <laughs> so yeah. you, don't, you don't have plausible deniability. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's kind of like, you know, I remember in grad school, I read a book that was like, have a write a lot. And, and one of the best pieces of advice of uh, pieces of advice in it, was that when you are when you have time time set aside to write to tell people it's a meeting yeah because they won't respect that you need to write even though it's like all your job is is writing almost right and so um so i need to figure out whatever trick that is <laughs> whatever that translates to as full professor I need to figure out that trick. What do I tell people to get out of some of this, some of this stuff? But, uh, but yeah, because like I said, you know, I would love to do that study for fun, but I don't know when I would do it. And like I said, I'm not going to like have some aspiring academic or, or practitioner <laughs> waste their time on a study about occupational surnames. Right.
what what I'd like to study is like how the psyop network actually works because how I how I became uh, familiar with you, yeah. Is in 2013 or 14, I went to a iPad conference in Atlanta. Oh. And I met Rachel William Smith there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we, we became first, my first student. Oh, really? My first PhD student. Yep. <laughs> So like we, we we stayed friendly. I mean, we we you know kept in contact. We see yeah, yeah. high up every year and like catch up and this sort of thing. And uh, we were here and actually sci up in Seattle. And she's like, "Well, you're you do a bunch of network analytics here. Talk to Megan Lowry." Yeah, like, yeah. So yeah. we started Megan, chatting, yeah. and she's like, "Here, uh, I, I did this really cool JAP paper on causal attitude networks yeah. with Nathan well, Carter." I was like, "She first authored a really great journal of vocational behavior." paper that was more her the jp was kind of my my thing but the the jvb was about the interplay between um interplay between counterproductive behavior and organizational citizenship behavior and that was like a directed networks type thing where you know we're looking at kind of trying to figure out cause and effects type stuff yeah but, um but the the jp was a much bigger undertaking and um I think if you look at it, it's like, I'm trying to remember how many authors there are on it, like 10 maybe or something. And that's just like, like it's a reflection of how long it took. I, there's also, I think somewhere there's a date that it was submitted. And then if you look at that and the date it was published, it was, it was oh. a slog. It was, uh, yeah, that was. There's uh, so, so many places we go there. Like one, the causal attitude yeah. networks is something that people aren't, necessarily doing right now we, we, we talk yeah. about it every so often uh, on the pod is people are starting to creep into sort of the vernacular uh, i yeah, think we took yeah, it to the yeah. next level with like the small world analysis etc and there's a great like our tutorial in the back on how to actually perform this yeah but I, what, what let's talk about like the jap like how, how do you do, do you think that it's going to be a good candidate do you know the uh editors do you are you waiting for a call for papers? How, how does that come about? So I think some some people take that approach. I mean, for me, it has always been just like, what do I want to study? You know, like, I mean, I don't think, and, and I know people would go, like, you know, this. I wouldn't even necessarily say this is advice, you know. Yeah. But for me, I've never cared at all, really, about journal. I mean, a little, you know, you, you care to the extent that like people want to, and I mean, one of the nice things about being in the psychology department versus the management department is like, you can publish in lots of different places and people will respect it as long as it's peer reviewed and it's not pay to play. And, you know, all the, as long as you're not doing that and it's a halfway, you know, a reputable solid journal, no one um, kind of thumbs their nose at it, but, but you know, you want to, you want to get, you know, for me, getting into JP is more about the audience that like, okay, the, the, right. it'll go to the most people if it goes to JP, right? Um, I don't hold it in any venerated <laughs> uh, esteem or anything. You know, I, I, I kind of think that that view on journals is, can be a little, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. Uh, there, there's a jadedness, I think, to like to <laughs> to starting with like what journal, you know. Um, and and again, people I respect do start that way, but you know that's just that's never what I've done. Um, so when I started with this, it was inspired by the the group of folks at the University of Amsterdam who really started this whole thing. And I mean, the Causal Attitude Network. You know, I was you know, tried to be as clear as possible that like Jonas Delage was kind of the person who, um, who put that forth. Um, and I think that he, well, can, can his, you tell us, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. tell us like what it is real quick just for our, our Yeah. Listeners? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's a very broad set of, and, and really all that it is that the, this kind of causal attitude network model or, and, and, and I think some of it, it's kind of like, calling it a model is a little bit of a misnomer calling it an approach is a, really what it is, is that social like, or sorry, not social, but just network theory at, at writ large is so well developed mathematically that you can make really specific predictions about certain things. 
and it is so tried and true and it crosses boundaries like from particle physics to like how how the um, how electric electrical grids are are composed across countries um, how um, you know uh, basically things that self organize right protein it, it, synthesis it, it, of cells yeah yeah all, yeah all there, I stuff. mean there's just you there's ton tons of stuff, neural networks all that stuff I mean that all starts with network theory right. And, you know, and one thing that was interesting to me is like I got into this stuff and kind of didn't realize like, oh, I will end up seeing some of the name because item response theory was kind of my thing for a long time. Hmm. And then I started realizing, oh, well, I'm seeing some of the same people, you know, uh, Snyder's, um, is it Tom Snyder? But it's an S-N-I-J-D-E-R-S. Um, you know, he did some stuff on, on IRT and I knew him from that. And then suddenly I'm seeing... That, oh, he's, you know, one of the kind of major players in like ergo, like exponential random graph models, uh, ergoms. Um, and, and, and it, it, and at the end of the day, what it comes down to is explaining patterns of ones and zeros or, you know, zero, one, two, three, fours, right? It's, a, it's just explaining these, uh, matrices of patterns of, of responding and, and how they, um, kind of how how they overlap and things like that so so that to me was a really interesting aspect of it but but you know the the you know the way i kind of have always thought of like what i do academically is um i read things other people aren't reading Mm -hmm. and i mean this Mm -hmm. is the advantage of being in an applied field is I, I just read things other people aren't reading. And then mm-hmm. I kind of bring it over and say, okay, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, the, the causal attitude network stuff started, I, I think Jonas Delage was doing um, like kind of political attitude stuff as the exemplar of, you know, how this works. But it became pretty clear to me like, oh, this really has a lot, you know, a lot Absolutely. of potential for, for job attitudes. And job satisfaction was kind of the obvious one. And, and what's really, to me, what was the most powerful thing about it was realizing, oh, like, you know, so for example, it, within the causal attitude networks kind of framework, there's this, and, and this goes to particle physics, there's this idea of like energy and the energy that it requ- is required to keep a system together. And that some systems are complex and require a lot of energy to hold, hold themselves together to, to, for that self-organization to stay where it is. And then there are ones that don't take much energy. And what was really cool to me is how consistent that was with like past attitude theory, like stuff people came up with in the twenties and forties and sixties and, you know, of you know, cognitive dissonance and, and things like that, that it all, it all kind of ends up saying the, you know, saying the same thing. But what the causal attitude network approach, I think, brings is a clear mathematical under an underlying mathematical formulation to, to what were kind of loose ideas that, that you could show with experimental methods and things, you know, cognitive dissonance was already very, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, already had a well-laid foundation, but, but to, to recognize that this thing that works for so many other subfields or, or not just subfield, but like totally different fields, other applications, yeah. as soon as you start thinking through it in the context of what you're looking at, you realize, Oh, like, like, you know, this does explain, you know, cognitive dissonance, you know, it, it does, you know, and cause basically, you know, the whole idea of cognitive dissonance is, is that if you start to form a belief that is inconsistent with your attitude, then like one, one of them's got to change. You've either got to change that belief or your attitude's got to change overall. And that's exactly what the network stuff would say is that, that, you know, thinking your job is boring and bad is a lot <laughs> easier than to think it's exciting and bad. And, and one of the two is going to end yeah. up changing at some point. Otherwise, that attitude structure has to has to fall apart. 
And so, and, and typically I don't think that's, that's really a, um, really an option for it to fully, you know, fall apart. And then, you know, you mentioned small worldness, which is, you know, uh, went right into like, you know, so we were kind of the first ones to say, well, like you can kind of have these like symbolic attributes and these instrumental attributes that you're looking at. And that with symbolic attributes, you would see this small world structure, which means that you can change the network by affecting a single node. And, and so like, you know, one part of that network, if you affect that part of the network, you can change the whole network. That so spillover you, effect is so critical, right? Oh, that, yeah. that, that's the super takeaway. Yeah. That, well, and, and then to me, it's also a takeaway that like, you know, if you want to change attitudes toward pay and promotion structures, then you have to change the attitude object. You can't, yeah. you can't affect a thought or a feeling and expect the attitude to change. The object has to change. And so, so to me, that was a really like, like a big moment for me of like, and, and, and I want to be clear that like, I don't even think of this. I don't think of this as like, I had that idea. It was like the, the network, that framework that Delage had kind of forwarded that we can use this to think about attitudes. It was like, it illuminated as I kept digging deeper and deeper. It was like, Oh, like, you know, that, that <laughs> explains why this works this way. And, you know, da, 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 da. So yeah, way but, more than like just factor analysis, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in fact, one of the things we show is that it, 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 like a structural equation model that predicts uh, turnover from you know overall job satisfaction scores. You know, one of the things we showed, which I think was probably the coolest part of the paper, is you know because the as the name would imply, there is kind of a indirect. There, there's a capability in these type of models through kind of like um, so, so basically kind of through logic patterns um, that will allow you to kind of make causal inferences with correlational data. And so one of the things we were able to show is like if you take your your cross sectional attitude network and you find what the most central item is in an attitude network. So, or thought, or, you know, of course we're casting it as thoughts and feelings, but at the end of the day, it's an item, right? Uh, and so if you find what thought or feeling is the most central, and by the way, feelings are usually more central, which mm -hmm. is also consistent with attitude theory that, that the affect is, is the first thing and then the cognition comes later. But the, um, but the, uh, the, what we found was that when we would identify with our cross-sectional data, so in 2000, you know, four, we use our cross-sectional data, so what's the most central item? And then we would look to see which item is capable of predicting change in all other items in a structural equation yeah. model. It was all the most central items were the ones that predicted the change in the other items. And, you know, and but then with intention or sorry, with turnover, we were also able to show that the network models could do a better job of predicting turnover in the end. And so, so to me, it was just this very like, you know, and, and no one had shown that before really with data. It all, had always been kind of like an in theory thing. And so, and luckily, you know, reviewers pushed us to kind of like back that up mm -hmm. and we were able to find the data to do that. Um, and through um, kind of just publicly available longitudinal data. Yeah. And, uh, and to me, that was fascinating. You know, I love the concept of bringing causality into social science research. Yeah, yeah. I love how one thing should be able to eventually impact a series of dominoes to make something else happen, even with our emotions. Yeah. And I think that, 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 that you have kind of crossed into new territory as a consequence. I do have something sort of random to bring up in relationship yeah. to them. <laughs> oh, you no. guys seen this new Netflix documentary series called American's Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. Have either of you seen this? I have not. No, no. It, not it is so related to what you're talking about right now. 
in terms of the methodology, okay. who, what, what, just the, 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 the version of this that's like really quick is this guy uncovers this corruption in, in Washington, DC, and he goes through and creates this causal network of how all these different things are linked to historical <laughs> things that are also linked to make this huge conspiracy about a global cabal who's like running things behind the scenes in the world. And he has literally has like this map drawn of the, that's called an octopus map of all of the interconnections and how they made these things happen to get to this final state. It's fascinating. And it's almost exactly what you're talking about, but it's about. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, that's awesome. And, and I mean, in fact, one of the, you know, if you get into social network analysis, one of the biggest example data sets that people use is the Medici network in Italy. And, you know, I mean, these are the people they invented banking, right? So it's like, you know, you know, talk about a family that ended up having control in a way that like, if you weren't a royal, you know, people just did not have it. And so, so I think, you know, yeah, no, I think that's a, a perfect example of like, how applicable network models are to so many different facets of, of life at the social level, at the person level, at the, you know, particle level, at the, you know, and even more macro levels. I think, you know, at, you know, I'm not a strategy person. I've never been that interested in that, but I'm sure these models have a ton that it could tell about like how, you know, how certain companies interact with other companies, you know, and, um, and yeah, it, it, you know, and probably also just, you know, things like mergers and acquisitions, being able to predict a merger, I, I would, would be, and there's probably your papers out there maybe oh, yeah. already showing that. So yeah, yeah, Matthew Jackson has a, a lot of research on this. And like one of the okay. biggest factors in reducing war is increasing trade between countries. Oh and yeah. Yeah. Create yeah. This network, uh, across, uh, different across the globe really but yeah. uh nathan you want to move on to the uh confusion matrix i'm down the confusion matrix let's do a little super random i mean just because cole brought up his tv show what is your favorite <laughs> guilty pleasure tv show or movie Okay, yeah, it's it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> I've, nice. I've fallen nice I've choice. fallen asleep to that show every day of my life since like two thousand six. Like I I have terrible <laughs> sleep problems, and so I have to listen to something to go to sleep. My wife always jokes that like for me to go to sleep, I have to listen to people yelling at each other because <laughs> it's always either been it's always sunny or Seinfeld. <laughs> and so, um, but no, yeah, it's always sunny is definitely my like by far. Like if you, you know, if you want a quote from a specific episode, I can, you know, I can usually pull it, but yeah. Your, your issue resonates so hard with me because I have to sleep with an earbud in and I sleep to uh, ancient aliens. It's something, <laughs> it's I can see that. Calm. <laughs> I can see that. No, it's yeah. calming and soothing yeah. and like a little talking that, and you don't have to pay attention. That, yeah. That ominous kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I can see that completely. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think the other thing that I listen to is like, is like war, doc, like war, doc, world war two documentaries. And oh, stuff. Like that's, that's the other sleeping. thing I that's fall sleeping. asleep to. But yeah, it does for whatever reason, there's something about it that is like, I don't know what it is. If it's, if it's the guaranteed overstimulation, I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. What do you got Cole? <laughs> I don't listen to anything when I go to sleep. Um, Good for you. Uh, yeah. I am a big, <laughs> or at least helps. I was at one point a big, it's always sunny fan. So <clears throat> yeah. we could get you yeah. some rum ham if you want it. Oh dude. Yes. Rum ham. Yeah. And in, in, <laughs> in my group of friends, like, like I'm definitely the Frank, like for sure. Like that's the joke is like, if I, you know, if everything were to fall apart, I would just become Frank potentially, but, Wild card, but man. yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. What, what, what is the most memorable concert uh, you've ever uh, attended? Oof. Most memorable? I, it would be the Flaming Lips opening for Beck. Oh, wow. And, that, and it was when Beck, be Beck had just started. I think Sea Change was the album that had just come out. So it was, and it was a sea change for him because it was like to acoustic kind of, 
and he had done acoustic stuff before, but this was like more melodic and uh, pretty songs, you know, like kind of, and, um, but I was definitely going for the Flaming Lips. I was a huge Flaming Lips fan. Um, yeah, starting with like the nineties, like the, she don't use jelly and stuff yeah. like that. But, but then, um, but so I went to see the Flaming Lips and they were unreal. It was a small theater in Cincinnati. Uh, and then, um, but then Beck came out and did his set solo acoustic. And then the Flaming Lips came back out as his backing band which we did not know that that's how it would go. And so, so then he played some of the kind of more typical, like at, at the time, what was typical of Beck, like, you L- know. Loser and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Odelay, the, yeah. um, you know, uh, oh, where, devil's it's haircut, at, this sort of where it's at. Yeah. Devil's haircut. Yeah. Stuff like that. But yeah. Um, so that one. Yeah. And then the, the band I've seen the most is Ween. And I, some people will know Ween, but it's a uh, G- Gene cool. and Dean Ween. That's right. That's Gene and Dean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> chocolate and cheese I've, album. What's I've up? I've probably seen them live. Yeah, chocolate and cheese. <laughs> yeah, I, I've probably seen them live twenty times at least. But I would say twenty to thirty somewhere in there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to see Tom Petty. Right before he oh, passed away, we didn't we didn't know he was going to pass away. So oh, that's but it became awesome. more meaningful after it happened. So, but that was oh yeah, fun. for sure, for sure. Yeah. I had a ticket to see Mitch Hedberg. Oh, and wow. then he and then he died. Oh wow! Before the show, so it was like, and there is a part of you that feels awful for calling Ticketmaster <laughs> and being like, "I need a refund." <laughs> you know what I mean? The, My the guy died on me. The guy died. And it wasn't back then it was like there was no like automated, you know, there wasn't like yeah. an automated refund. There was no button anybody could push to refund everyone at the Mitch Hedberg. So so it was literally like everyone had to call and request the refund. And, you know, obviously we're giving it, but it does feel weird doing it with a an artist that's just passed. But yeah. But I do wish I could have seen Mitch Hedberg. But. Uh, I, I saw Nirvana, but I also saw Beck. Really? Right, right when, right when, um, uh, the loser came out, and yeah, is it Deep Ellum Live or is the Bomb Factory now? But he's like five foot four. He's tiny, yes. tiny, yes. tiny person. Yeah, he's Prince. He's the same size as Prince, basically. Yeah. Pr- uh, oh my God! 2000- Prince is a unit of measurement for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. On many levels, <laughs> on many dimensions, he's a, a unit of measurement. Yeah. I'm like 1.3 princes tall. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, I am Prince. You know, kind of um, dissed. At a, what, what's at, your body mass? Are you like at some award ceremony? 1.7 yeah. Prince. Mass I think I, I'm probably in body mass. I'm like two and a half princes. <laughs> pretty, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna get this, an unkilling, uncomfortable prince territory here in a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those heel, the heels that Prince wore would not support my, my body mass. <laughs> if you want good watching, like uh, try and find the 2007 Super Bowl halftime show. It's probably the best. Oh, dude, one. yeah. No, I remember. Unreal. I watched that a lot. Um, the um, but the, I mean, the best, the thing I've gotten multiple converts to Prince on is he had a DVD that I used to have. I don't think I have it anymore. I don't even know if you can get it anymore. But it was live at the Aladdin. And it was probably like 2003 or four. And man, like, but I, I can't tell you how many people who thought they didn't like Prince that yeah. I was able yeah, to yeah, convert yeah. just That's showing true. them that DVD. Yeah. I don't think people realize just how good of a guitar player he is. When I was a little kid, I thought he pretended to play guitar. Yeah. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, it was Absolutely. not. And then when I was in middle school or early high school, I got, I, I was subscribed. I was, a, I played guitar since I was young and, and uh, I subscribed to Guitar Player Magazine and they had a whole thing about him. And I was like, what? Like, I, I thought he pretended, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that he just had really good studio. It turns out all the really good studio musicians he had were mostly him because he, I mean, the the albums where there's no band name on it, if it's just Prince, 
he played he everything. everything. Yeah, drums, bass, guitar, even yeah, all the synth stuff. Um, yeah, he's. Hey, we'll we'll, we'll do we'll do one more. Um, yeah. Do you have strong feelings about placemats on the table? No. <laughs> <laughs> other other than. No one should have strong feeling about place bets on the table. <laughs> I would say that that oh, is the you're strong feeling. Me. I, I do. I'm I not. Do. A, I, I grew up in I'm a not lot an of... orderly person. I'm not. You are not an orderly person. Uh-uh. 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 <laughs> no, no. I'm chaos. Yeah, I thrive in chaos. Yeah. So, do you have place bets, Cole? The uh, on nice occasions, but I'm really intrigued by your strong feelings about it. I want to know more. I, I think I, I think it's because I grew up with my mother. Like, if she saw a flat table with nothing on it, like that was not good. So, right, you, know, you got to put magazines down or this sort of thing. And then I eventually became triggered. Like, why the fuck do we got a placemat? I know where to sit. I know where it is. And oh, now, so like, you I, you are anti placemat. I am so anti. I want to take okay. it. Like, I, I I will accept a charger dish. I will. You know, a charger dish. Like, like you put your plate on there. I will accept that. The okay. placemat, like I throw it in the fucking trash. Like no, <laughs> no, no placemat. They are irritating, but yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna convert people. We don't need these. Sort of yeah, things. yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's do some nerdery, Nathan. You ready? All right, yeah. The nerdery. All right, do I'm some nerdery. Start. How about the uh, cost of knowledge, Cole? Does that sound good? It sounds great. <laughs> Okay, uh, this article examines the high price of academic journals' access to publish uh, published research, uh, mm-hmm. specifically in the world of physics, economics, and electrical engineering. Uh, and it examines variability in journal prices and how it relates to citations and collaborations. Uh, specifically, they talk; uh, they have a database of uh, articles from 2009 to 2018, and they analyzed effects of these uh, prices on citation volume. And overall, the findings suggest that uh, high prices significantly reduce article citations and collaboration efforts, so co-publishing. Uh, the impacts are most pronounced at low-tier institutions, and open access significantly uh, boosts citation counts, and improved accessibility enhances uh, knowledge dissemination. These are also field-specific, whereas predominantly effects are in physics and economics, but could also be in uh, psychological researchers uh, re- research if um, it were studied, but you know I, I I get it. Whenever I see a paywall, not an article, I was like, no, nah, we're moving on. Yeah, 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 um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I'm I'm all for open access. I think these, yeah, the publishing companies are just ridiculous. I mean, we're the uh, you know the free labor for all the reviewing and. I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, what would be great is if I I think if more journals just went to a fully online format and yeah did away with the whole thing. I think um, Scott Highhouse tried to do that, um, and so you see the you see the problems that you would face getting away from the traditional thing through that, because he, I mean, he just had to shut the journal down a personnel assessment and decision. It's a great journal. It was, it was had great. A, had a great board. I mean, I was so excited to be a part of it, you know, when, cause I, I was, I don't think I was on the founding board, but I was, it was like very quickly after it was founded. And I, I mean, I remember the editorial he wrote about, you know, how, um, you know, we're a more mature science now. We don't need these like, you know, rambling, you know, or like, you know, six page introductions that, right. Absolutely. You know, start with literally like job satisfaction is a, you know, blah, 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 you know, define it. And then why is it important? And, uh, you know, and that we could probably, you know, the more mature a science become, the more it needs to do away with that, which I think is because it is like the more mature we become, the longer they get. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, absolutely. You know, yeah. and you go back and read the, those articles from like the seventies and they, you know, one, one of the things I really like about reading older articles is a, and this is something I kind of wonder if we'll have to return to a little, and we're, we're working on a paper now where we're facing this issue a little, 
which is that, you know, now we're, we're, you know, and I'm very much in favor of this, but expected to be a lot more forthcoming about like exactly how things went down as you're conducting the study. Right. Wait, wait, just like deeper into the methods or. Well, no, no, no. Like being like, okay, well, we started off thinking this. And then this is this like happened. pre-registration type of stuff. A little bit, but but it's it's not even the pre-registration that is good or bad. It's that I, I think that's all good. The, you know, the pre-registering, the registered reports, all that stuff. What we haven't adjusted are expectations about how things get written out. And so we have a paper right now where it's literally like like we okay we want to. What are the dimensions of openness, right? Mm-hmm. What are what's the the hierarchical structure of openness? Okay, so we start off wondering that, and then we start to investigate that, and we realize a more interesting issue, and because we thought that would be a quick boom, we're done yeah. type study, right? And we had the analytic approach ready to go. We you know we knew kind of we had like a blueprint of other other studies that have done it, and then what we realizes like okay well there's this one factor that is so narrow and da 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 and what we start to realize is that it's all items that are like you know i'm smart <laughs> i mean basically it's just, just self assessed intelligence type item i'm a quick thinker i know a lot of big words i you know th- those yeah. types of things where you're like it's just essentially bragging about how smart you are <laughs> and so and so what but then so what we so then the question became well what if we take those words out right and so now the way that you know 10 years ago i would have done this is i would have just said well i mean it doesn't really matter what order all this happened in Right. We'll just say we're starting off with looking at structure and wondering whether or not these items belong. Right. But now. And I think it's better that we not do that to rearrange it so that the story flows nicely. But we're very concerned about, like, turning a paper in to a set of AEs and reviewers that expect papers to have this narrative literary flow that and and those old articles from like the 20s 30s 40s 50s they don't have that narrative flow i mean they will say and then we thought this, you know and, and then i thought well what about blah blah blah, blah. and then you know i talked to this person and they said that it, you know and it's i mean it's literally just so much more conversational and there is not the citing to get away to 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 Citing, citing cartels as as the reason for what? No, not even that. I, I mean, I don't care about the like citing. I did this. Oh, and someone else had done it with before. no, just like yeah, just no rationale, yeah. and and because that was something you know as a grad student that was beat out of me very quickly is like yeah. never just say you did it because somebody else did it that you know that that's that's a cardinal sin you know and so so i do think that you know we've got to reevaluate that but i do i do love those old the old articles i feel like we could learn a lot from because there's a lot of clarity of exposition and it gave more freedom for an author to just tell you what actually happened and now it's like there's this whole form, you know, formula. Especially if you go to a business school, they're going to tell give me. You tell me what you think about this idea, Nathan, because I think yeah, I join yeah, yeah. you in this. Yeah, it is what if we just had the old articles, like the old style, and mm-hmm. just increase the sample sizes? Because if you look at them, That's, the biggest yes. criticism of the old ones is they're just really, really small sample sizes, and then I think you fix a lot of stuff. I think you would have to be more i mean like like for example like i don't think we can go back to like articles that have you know three references right because those those folks were dealing with nothing there was nothing to stand on so i I think other than that though i agree with you completely like that that type of and and, because here's the thing what are they're actually readable yeah like they're really readable Yes. And that's what I was going to say is what are people gravitating toward now? 
They're gravitating toward people's blogs and stuff. They're not gravitating. They're gravitating away from journals and toward blogs. And I think especially if academics and I.O. want to stay relevant for practitioners, then that is the way to do it is like it's freely available. It you don't have to adhere to this like. I don't even I and I would love to know. And I, I guess it just was a slow process of just like, where did it come from? You know, this. Well, the public. What I've used is with the, what the I've used a formulaic way of writing. I, the problem I, with the cost of knowledge that Scott brought up that article is the most important research is the most expensive to access. Mm -hmm. yes, and so, why do yeah. people go to blogs? Is because I can hear from the same researcher who's doing the most important research. Yeah. I don't have to pay. And it's readable. So it's like yes. a double whammy of yes. like, I can actually access it in two yeah. ways. I can access it monetarily and in prose. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, Paul Spector wrote. Uh, uh, I was going to bring that up post. earlier about what oh, well, yeah, okay. the journal. The, yeah. the one about um, reviewers and the kind of crisis of reviewers. Yep. And, and, you know, one of the big things people were bringing up is the, is like, kind of like why are we going through three four rounds of revisions and da, 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 da. Absolutely. And I do think after that first round, right? Now there are exceptions, right? Like and, and in fact the JP we were to the the can the causal attitude network paper is an exception to this where even on the second and third round we're getting really meaningful substantive comments that changed the paper and made it better that made us go collect more data made us you know, you know, really dig in on things we hadn't dug in on enough. You know, I, I think that, I think that you, that, but, but I think that that's the exception and that typically one round is enough, you know, especially when the article isn't doing something huge and it's clearly an incremental contribution, which is great. Most of science is incremental contribution, right? And I mean, even Einstein, he, you know, the reason he won the Nobel Prize was not for theory of general relativity. It was a more incremental contribution he made to kind of what ended up being like quantum mechanics. Right. And so so it's like. I do think that what ends up happening, the things for the most part in the second and third round that end up happening is them making your writing more formalized and less mm. readable is actually what's ending up happening. So I would love to see a return to where you could talk in the first person, even, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can say, we did, you know, we did this and, oh, and then like, you know, Carter or, you know, whichever author thought about this. And then we, you know, da, 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 and, and, but we really have had, you know, a paper that should have been easy to write became very difficult to write just because we were trying to really do the right thing and say, here's exactly how this went down and not some semi fit. Cause, and cause in the end, I don't think it would have mattered that much in terms of just like the way we're, you know what I mean? It's t telling the story, right. Which I think is like a <clears throat> phrase we need to knock out. Um, we're going to need to speed up the publishing yeah. process, especially as technology yeah. becomes more and more rapidly available. Yes, I, I, I get it. We, we need peer review, but yeah. I mean, with these articles come open after like what ten years online. Yeah. I mean, that's way yeah. too late. We too it's late. way too late. Yeah, well, a month is too late. And, exactly. and in fact, one thing someone brought up on there was like. By the time you get through the review process, what you're what you've done, especially in the AI machine learning type oh, space, irrelevant. It's already done. No, everybody's everybody in AI and machine learning has moved on twice since you've since you've uh, submitted that article. You know, so so yeah, but yeah. I th but I think like a lot of things. I don't. I don't think that this is unique. To academia, I think it's you know everything changes at such a rapid pace, and we're not used to that as as humans. You know, I mean, and even one time I was talking to you know my advisor Mike Zicker, and and we were, and I was kind of saying like I you know I have no, I'm just like done learning new programming, <laughs> like I'm just not doing it. Yeah. And he was like, you sound like me after you know 20 years or what you know, 
And I was like, it is, do you know what, like the time scale was different, but the amount of change that happened from 2011 to 2020 is a lot bigger. Oh. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. But uh, it's a lot bigger than the time, than what happened from 1998 to, you know, 2008. Right. It, that it, it's, it just keeps getting faster and faster. And, um, and yeah, yeah. Keeping up is hard. It's hard. Well, Scott, do you want to do one more? Or you want to wrap up? Let's do one more. We, we got one more. In us. What right. do you want to do? What, you want to do college consumption or zombie? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, just because uh, we're coming up on March Madness and Nathan, you work at a big time basketball program <laughs> and your professor. Uh, this article examines the impact of college basketball consumption on student academic performance and future donor behavior. Not exactly sure where they uh, focused in on that, but specifically attendance to big time events. So they are, have, they, uh, are they in a business school? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. What does it Looks say? like Department of Economics. Economics. Oh, yes. It's, it's so donors, economics donors matter a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they uh, have uh, data from a large public university with a highly ranked men's basketball team where season tickets are allotted via a lottery system. So they're, you know, high demand. On uh, the overall at- uh, findings are attending games slightly reduces academic performance, but with the most significant impact on low achieving students. And in-state students, uh, this effect is during the season and when the team plays in the postseason tournament. Uh, no significant impact on donor behavior, but uh, they say uh, that such events can impact uh, higher education achievement with no impact on actually boosting giving gains. Um, I mean, th- th- this makes sense. Like, college is all about time management, right? You need to learn how to work independently. Yeah. You need to be able to balance studying and go into events, et cetera. I don't right. think anyone's saying that you shouldn't ever uh, engage in some sort of entertainment, but it definitely can impact you. The assumption though, is that you take the, like, do you, like if you take the college sport away, that it goes to academic exactly exactly so i think people would just play more video games or what you know whatever it is or you know or or you know i mean how many people is is uh you know college sports just an excuse to binge drink and uh (laughs) and and lightly riot Oh yeah, I mean, like, well, you you got to like pregame for the game, right? You got to do your drinking. You got to go to the game. You got to do the post game. Got to go to the bar afterwards. Well, to me, what's most well uh, to me, what that all that I heard in those results is people who are already struggling shouldn't focus on other things. See, my thought was the the low performing student. They were going to the school for the sporting event, not for the school. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. But well, and also, of course, they are more affected by going to to the games because they're the ones who because the high performing people are doing just fine, and so they can afford to. So to me, it's a question of like, can you afford to take the time off and do something else, right? Time Whether is, it's sports yeah, or not. Really. And I mean, I'm not even. I'm not a big. No, I'm not. I don't pay attention to any sport at all, at, at all. Uh, and so, you know, I like to watch college basketball, but I don't. You know, I didn't grow up in a family that followed it that way. Uh, you know, I, part of it maybe is being from Kentucky, where we have no professional sports teams. And uh, <laughs> but but are there none? You know, I guess there there are none. Uh, no, 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 no. You, I mean, UK basketball is about yeah. it's, that's that's all you got really. <laughs> And so no, now foot now UK football is pretty good, but I but I mean you know we didn't follow like we didn't like have our, our our team like there was no none of that. I mean you know we watched games. You know I like watching like I said basketball sports that move more quickly. I'm, I'm not a football fan, uh, but but you know but I guess I'm just saying that to say like. So I'm not just like defending college yeah. sport. I'm not. And in fact, there are other reasons I would say I would love to see a separation uh, between, you know, uh, there's been ideas floated, for example, of like 
you know, allowing the college, call it, especially now that we're getting to the point where we're like, you know, college. I, I mean, part of it, like, it's like NCAA, the, the whole thing of like the NBA doesn't take people straight out of high school and, you know, all the, I mean, to me, the history of that has led to the point we're at, which is now, you know, rightfully, college players are now allowed to take endorsements and actually make money off of their name while they're, you know, while they're hot, you know, right. well, and they the should be able to do that. In the store. Right. But the question is, to me, whether or not that should even be a thing that is really affiliated with the university. And one idea that has been floated that I kind of liked is separating the two organizations fully but then the university licenses out its name and, and image to the team, right? So you and would so have like a professional sports team associated yeah. with each university. Because what is it? Isn't it just becoming that? It's kind of like that you know, right now. What, right? what is it now? You're right? These kids are becoming millionaires while they're in college, you know, and, and more power to them. But but I, I do think it presents, there presents, there it brings a lot of, potential and and probably already occurring conflict of interest into the university system which i think is not healthy so so i so i have other reasons that i would say but academic performance i don't i don't really buy the thrust of the article you know and i i didn't dig into the methodological details but you know one question would be like what's up with kids who aren't into sports right do we see the same thing yeah, yeah. I, where it said uh, it's low achieving sto- folks as well as in-state students like, right. that Cole mentioned as far as like attending. But school. by the way, isn't that just like also probably lower? Achi- like you know, what I mean, for real, they're probably like, yeah, as opposed you know, to like say uh, exchange student, you know, foreign students, right? Well, and, well, and people will have no from out, of, from out of state on and have like a scholarship to a, you know because the thing is right is like. You know, I was an in-state college student. There's no no shade being thrown here, but you know, if you go in-state, it's usually cost. Cost is the reason. Yes, and that absolutely. usually means that you didn't get some awesome scholarship to a better school out of state. Right now, the exceptions are, you know, I'm from Texas. I go to UT Austin. I'm from Michigan. I go to U- University of Michigan. Right? And, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> but. <laughs> But you know, like, you what know, are you doing, man? Are you trying like, to dig your own grave? <laughs> I think I think we all know. I think we all know. I, I think look at the endowments, and and I think I think we're good. But but you know, for real, you know, people people don't come to Michigan from out of state to go anywhere but the biggest school in Michigan. Absolutely. People don't go to Texas to go to college, except to go to UT Austin. You know, so it's like they're sort of saying the same thing two different ways. Like, you know, students who aren't necessarily, right. I'm not saying they're bad students, but just that they're not like the best students that are going to be at the school. But yeah. Cole, Cole's got mad basketball skills. I think he has four years of eligibility. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to. Nice. Nice. Him join the team. Uh, that's not true in any way, but Nathan, <laughs> uh, it's been fantastic having you on the pod. Um, awesome. Thanks so much for sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, before we give you the final word, Scott, any parting words for Nathan? Nathan, man, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, how can folks reach out to you? Should they want to? Uh, email ntcarter at msu.edu. That's that's about it. Just don't Google him. You won't no, find him. No, him. it'll you will get someone else. It'll either be the running back or the Canadian singer. There's a Canadian singer named Nathan <laughs> Carter. It's very popular. But his Twitter handle is the real Nathan Carter. For any of you who are looking. <laughs> Um, so. <laughs> yeah, they'll definitely pick up some good music from you. Yeah. Well, you've been listening to uh, Directionally Correct, a People and Looks podcast with Colin Scott and today's guest, Dr. Nathan Carter. Thanks for joining us, Nathan. Have a good one. Hey, guys. Directionally Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners, to help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you are helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash directionally correct. Thanks for your support.